we're back live second go round with live q a with miles shoal from abbey road studios we're back i apologize for that uh i don't know we're back after the break uh, there was a break yeah they like having adverts these days on youtube i noticed they put more and more in so that was that's the longest commercial break i've ever seen well anyway. i just had i had some issues and i mean we got it yeah. we got it back up so i apologize Restful thank you for everyone out. for rejoining thank you for uh, doing this again I know we were only scheduled for an hour, so we're going over your time, but thank you. Don't worry. Where did we get to before we were rudely interrupted? I was talking I about the single, and I think I've managed to finish that because I did see some comments that came in after well, I'd spoken let's about go, the single. Let's go so back we just as recap well. The single? Let's go ahead and recap everything. And I know I won't put you on full screen right now. I'll just put you the way it is and recap okay. the single, recap the, the red album, blue album, go. Okay. Uh, well, there was the announcement. Um, or was it Thursday? The single's coming. Uh, the new single, the last ever new Beatles single, was called Now and Then, and it's lovely. So we'll discuss that in a minute. But also, about a week after the single, they are reissuing the famous Red and Blue compilations. These are the new versions. There'll be three LPs now, not two. LP1 and LP2 will be as they always were. The third album is other songs that probably should have made it but weren't considered worthy in 1973 now we've got the benefit of knowing what people are into so they've done a third lp of extra tracks bonus tracks all of the songs on all of the albums and all six albums are remixed uh by giles and sam um and i have to say especially the red album They've gone right back to the the Please Please Me albums. Yeah, that, they were done very crudely. Two track recordings, all of the vocals on one channel, all of the instruments on another channel. It's all glued together. Uh, Wingnut, the Peter Jackson company, they've done the um, source separation demixing as they did for Revolver. And I was blown away by that. You want to hear that early stuff? It's just, they, it jumps out the speakers. On the third lp of the red album is i saw her standing there which wasn't on that album originally no and it just it's like 20 year old guys having fun right in front of your ears I mean, it's just really so alive and the it sounds the stereo separation is so natural it's as if it's how it always was it doesn't sound processed and too much you know mucked around with it just sounds really lovely and natural and the separation software has got so good that there are two people clapping on that track. I don't know who it was. Maybe it was George and Paul. Maybe it was John and Paul. I don't know. They've separated the individual claps. So you've got mm. John clapping on the left and Paul on the right. Now, how the software can look at the signature and go, this clap is different to that clap, you know, and it puts them left and right. Unbelievably good. So, yeah, the, the Red and Blue albums, sorry. Yeah, Red and Blue albums are great, but the new single is what everyone's excited about, and that's coming uh, November second, I think it November is. November second, yeah, yeah, Thursday. Yeah. So we're four days away, and that's a great song. Really nice way for them to bring down the curtain and say, "That's it, we're done," because it's that's the last ever new Beatles single. There's nothing else new that they can put out. We started with "Love Me Do," and we're ending it with "Now and Then." Yeah, and on the B side of "Now and Then." Is Love Me Do. Did you know that? Was that uh, that did get announced, I think. So, and that was my idea. And I said to them, look, if this is the last ever single, they said, Well, let's put the instrumental on the B side. I said, No, nah, boring, don't do that. You've got to couple it up with um the first ever single, but let's go with the original UK seven inch version, which was the one with Ringo playing drums the version that became more popular, more known was the re-recorded version with Andy White, the session drummer. Cause in the early days, there were some questions about unfair. I must say questions about Ringo. Uh, oh. They just weren't sure. And also they hadn't, George Martin hadn't seen much of Ringo because when they'd done their demo, they were with Pete Best. Um, right. And then be between the demo and recording of love me do Ringo had replaced Pete. So, um, you know, that's that happened anyway. So I spoke to uh, Universal, who in turn spoke to Apple about it. And uh, they said, oh, no, there's no tape for that recording. You have to take it from an old seven inch and it sounds awful. I said, look, 
give me a try give me give me a morning just to have a go at it if you don't like it i won't charge you so i managed to come across uh, there's a guy here who had a couple of copies two original 60 year old seven inches so i dubbed from those and uh edited between them to get rid of the worst of the noise they weren't mint condition these were they weren't worn out but they you know they weren't mint so edited between the two um copies uh, to get rid of the worst noise and the worst wear then i said about fixing anything else that was left you know bit by bit so i don't do a kind of one size fits all declick it and get rid of the clicks because that just kills all of the audio you have to go through stop it there's a click fix that little that little segment you fix that because clicks are tiny if i was to do a one size fits all across the whole song it, all the claps get soft and the drums go soft and it just goes mushy so I wanted to keep it as clean sounding as possible because it's actually a really nice recording uh that first version of love me do so once i got rid of that then i said about mastering it once i got a clean source uh, and i just thought to myself well how did tape sound you know when this stuff was new and this is basically those old tapes when they were in mint condition the high frequencies just take your head off they're so bright so i did my best to kind of re-inject that back into it um, sent it off to Apple and they said, yeah, we love it. It's going on the record. That's it. So later on, um, they then sent my restored version to Peter Jackson's people to demix it. So then Giles and Sam, so went full circle to them, <coughs> excuse me. They, they then did a new stereo mix. So you have the original, uh, October, 1962 version of love me do remixed in very nice very tasteful stereo so i hope people like it but the a-side song uh now and then is really really beautiful and the now and then song it was something to do with john's vocals at the time uh they were just mm. not ex they weren't acceptable in terms of uh what well, you were hearing yeah. from that tape that's the story you hear uh apparently george wasn't happy with how john sounded and certainly i heard an earlier mix of this song because uh, i started working on this a year and a half ago and they only had the old extraction done in the 1990s from John's voice from the demo cassette. And it sounded pretty kind of nasally and thin, you know, really horrible kind of mm -hmm. strangled sound, like it was recorded from an old cylinder or something, you know, like, like John was singing from the 1920s. And uh, they managed to locate the original cassette. Sean Ono Lennon, John's son, looks after the cassettes found the original tape got a new dub made of that and that got sent to peter jackson's people in new zealand they extracted john's voice amazingly well i mean so well they people say oh it's got ai it's like there's no ai on that recording at all it's all john but what's happened is they they managed to just lift the voice out so their their software says this is a piano this is a guitar this is a vocal we just want the vocal everything else gets removed and the first time i heard the new mix with the newly restored vocal it's just blew my mind it's it's very nearly studio grade it's clear as a bell you you really wouldn't know it's how it's like a really good live recording um uh, it's totally amazing and it's a lovely song and it's nearly all john it's there's not much paul in it it's it's far paul's very very generous with this um he's just like backing up john the way they did in the 60s so i you know as a fan obviously i'm gonna like anything they do but i do i do love the song i think it's a really Just, fitting way to say i'm goodbye. excited are you do you yeah. have a do you have a favorite beatles song oh i wasn't expecting that question uh, <laughs> um probably golden slumbers in the end you know, I mean, the whole of the whole medley, the whole of, of uh, side two of, of Abbey Road is just astounding, you know. And uh, but, yeah, I think if you from if you play it from from Golden Slumbers onward, that's that's a pretty amazing thing. Ringo's drum solo at the beginning of the end. Oh, all of that's just amazing. I, re I recall in an interview that Ringo really, really liked the way his drums sounded in the on the Abbey Road recordings. Didn't he get new drums for that or something? There was some there was something I remember reading about years ago about why he liked his drumming the way it sounded back then. Do you remember? Uh, that? No, 
I yeah. wasn't there. <laughs> so I don't know anything about that. Yeah. I haven't read that interview. So, I, something, something uh, maybe I'm making yeah. it, but I, I swear, I swear, I read about that. But yeah, that's. Uh, There'll be some yeah. Beatles fans watching this. I'm sure. Maybe they can they can elaborate in the comments, and we, we yeah, can. Yeah, I I thought he got new drums or something to do with his drums, but you definitely. I mean, they are very. You know, they're very. You hear them in, in every single track, and yeah, I think he's really proud of the the way they sound in that album. If I'm not mistaken, from the interviews he's done. Yeah, that album does sound different to all of the others because that album was recorded with a TG console. That's the EMI mm. um, transistor console that just got installed in Studio 2 a week or two before they recorded Abbey Road. All of the other albums were done on the Tube console, the, uh, the Red console, R-E-double-D. Uh, and they do sound quite different. Abbey Road's got a very, very different sound. Uh, so maybe that's what he liked. He liked the way it, that uh, the transistors and the circuits in those desks made it uh, made made his drum sound. I don't know. So you enjoyed working with the demixing software, getting the final project to master. Like, what were your thoughts on it in the very beginning when you first sort of came across it? Yeah, well, I'd, I've obviously I've worked with Giles and Sam since 2015. On the first thing I did with them was the Number Ones album. You know, the, the red cover with the one. Uh, and they did some remixes for that and I, I got invited to have a go and they liked my work so that's when I started working with them and so I don't ever hear it demixed I only ever hear their new stereo remix so I don't even know what they're working on until I get a phone call or an email saying okay we've done something can we book you in you know because it's all very very secret and that's the thing I think people need to, I guess, viewers need to uh, learn about you is that you're you're contracted, sort of you're a sole proprietor yourself as a as a master engineer. You don't work for Abbey Road per se, or how does that how does that relationship work? Yeah, it's a very good relationship. It's a kind of based on equals, really. Uh, I'm one of the team. They have staff mastering people here who've been here for some time, and they have a couple of us who are freelancers, myself and the chap I share this room with. We're both freelancers. So we're on this team, but not on the staff. So um, we it's our job to attract in work that otherwise normally would not come here. Now, obviously, the Beatles is an exception, but um, Giles is the boss of that, and if he chooses me, then I'm delighted that he does and i'm i'm the i'm the guy for the job but normally i would be trying to bring in work that wouldn't come here you know they they weren't doing any kind of half speed mastering before i came here you know and that, and, i brought that, that to the table and that leads me to another thing too about the half speed mastering is it something the beatles or their you know their team want from you or want from you is that the half speed mastering or what how does that all come about who makes that decision that's a decision for Giles. And okay. that's the way it's been since number ones. Uh, he said, yeah, we want you to cut it and we want it done half speed. And that's that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't choose to do stuff half speed just for the sake of it. Um, it's it's purely the client would, would choose that. You know, I'd, I do regular cutting as well. I don't only do cutting at half speed, which is good because I go crazy because uh, I might play some later on. Some half speed audio is pretty damn awful to listen to in the studio for me <laughs> records sound great at the end of it but trust me i'll tell you what so I, so I play a bit now i've got something actually lined up here okay uh, one of the well, i did a box set the decker put out the wagner ring cycle the famous george mm. Shelty recordings so uh there were three sets of records that came out all about five lps each now it took about eight to nine hours to do each one each each block and uh i'll play you this is a bit of a bit of audio so this is what i have to listen to as i'm cutting sounds a bit like this can you imagine that, nine and you hours to, of that i was gonna say that's nine hours a day of that that's that's funny it sounds yeah. like something yeah, well, some, it sounds it, it sounds like something off of revolution number nine yeah, well, probably, yeah, could have been. Um, <laughs> the, the thing is, is you, you cannot leave the room when it's going. Even if, you know, those albums were 45, 50 minutes at half speed each side, and they didn't want to have any band markers between the, the um, pieces, just one long, one long track. But you can't walk out of the room and 
go and get a cup of tea or something else or go to the toilet while it's cutting because you yeah. just know that in that one minute you're not in in earshot of the monitors uh it'll go wrong so uh you have to sit there and, and baby it and i've the longest day i did for half speed was i did 17 hours non-stop half speed once and walked out of here pretty kind of crazy you know so but the reason why i do it is because when you get the records back they just have this otherworldly sound that you can't get at real time and that's just, i was going to ask you like so what do you say about the detractors that don't think half speed is the way to go and i mean i'm sure you've heard all the you know all the pros all the cons and all the different forums that talk about this like what do you mm. say to everyone about half speed mastering and, and your thoughts on it and why you think it's the best way to go for cutting vinyl well you can't please all the people all the time and you shouldn't try to you know it's, it's horses for courses i've yet to come across a genre that does not benefit from being cut half speed um because you, you know effectively you're using a lot less current a lot less heat a lot less energy to carve that groove plus you're giving the stylus twice as long to do its job uh you know you've got to think of the sound waves that you hear out of your speakers are a wavy groove on a disc and that's mm -hmm. that's what it is so you know if you cut that down by a factor of two all the stuff that needs a lot of current a lot of energy the top end especially uh becomes mid-range much much easier to get mm -hmm. on uh, so yeah, the only person who has the downside is me having to listen to it. Listen to that for 17 hours. That, like yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, it's, but I, thought, I remember once my dad came in, I don't know why he visited, he popped in and I was doing something half speed. He said, bloody hell, you earn your money, don't you? <laughs> Cause he just couldn't stand it. And one of the other engineers who works here, who, who totally appreciates the benefit of the cuts that I do at half speed, but he personally can't stand the sound, you know? He just says, you've got the patience of a saint. How do you put up with it? But I just, you just got to put your mind in the future and thinking, I know the records are going to come back better. So, and that's what we're here. We're here to make it better. That's the, why, why would I carry on doing the same thing I've always done or people have always done? You've got to try and you know, you bring something new to the, the, the table, I think. I don't know if you can answer this. Uh, hi, Steve Miles question. What about the Dolby Atmos mixes in the red and blue promo? One can read that Atmos was just for six or seven songs, all that were mixed in 2015. Why not all in Atmos? I'm not sure if you know the answer. I, as far as I'm aware, now I wasn't involved in the Atmos, but I think it's all available in Atmos. Okay. I think, as far as I know, I don't do the Atmos mastering as a different engineer. Uh, and I know he spent many hours working on it, so I can't believe he would have spent many hours for six or seven songs. So my gut says that they're all going to be available, even the really early stuff. That then that would be a challenge. You imagine you know, there's, when there's just the four of them. Uh, but yes, I think I think they are all all of the the uh, songs from both LPs, both sets are. Um, or an Atmos, as far as I know. Now, I'm not the gospel on that, but I think that's the case. Okay. Uh, Jim Morrison's Lizard, he says the Brian Ferry half speed sounds spectacular. Ah, oh, that's very kind. Thank you. Thank and you. I really, I, I, I really like your Roxy Music Avalon cut that you did as well. I thought that sounded really good. Well, it's such a fantastic sounding album. You, you'd have to work hard to make that sound bad. You know, but it's yeah, it's on a great record too. Such a great record. Such a great and is my favorite Roxy music record of all time. I mean, it just that's the one that I, you know, have yeah. such great memories with younger and it's got every single song, it just flows, right? It's amazing. Yeah, it's a fantastic record. George Borden, do you do all digital processing in PCM? Almost always, yeah, because the uh I can work from um DSD. But it's not actually doesn't lend itself well to doing any kind of processing. I try to do most of the work I do in the analog domain before if I'm doing the mastering, because sometimes I'm just cutting stuff that somebody else has mastered. It's and I don't do anything with it. Uh, but if I'm doing the mastering, I have a whole console here full of esoteric um, analog gear. In fact, behind me, if I move out of the way, yeah. there's a tube compressor there you might that gold thing you know, i'm gonna i'm gonna put your full screen so the so, folks can see this one second so okay, there it is there you go there you go so yeah. that's yeah that's um under the keyboard let's take the keyboard away I, yep. there that's that's new 
but it's a very, very faithful recreation of the legendary uh, Fairchild 670 compressor, which is the kind of godfather of compressors. Uh, legend has it, it was uh, designed by Les Paul, and they've gone down in history as the most amazing sounding units. And that was built by a friend of mine. It takes him eight zero eighty man hours to make one because wow. it's got 24 tubes in the back of it. It gets really hot. It's a 400 watt heater, basically. So you can't have it on a printed circuit board because you just melt it. So everything that needs connecting has point to point wiring. Uh, hmm. But it's the same tubes the same uh transformers better capacitors than they had in the um in the early 60s uh i've got special very high quality switch pots in it so yeah anyway to go back to the question most of my processing if i'm doing you know mastering work to kind of make it sound nice i'll do that in the analog domain any fine tuning i have to do which is usually the dsing i'll do that digitally because that's the best way to do that uh, but yeah, largely analog. Here's a question from John Bandy. Are the half speed miles masters from a digital transfer always from flat analog masters? For instance, I understand Stone's XL half speed is from a 2009 file that is rather compressed. I have to work with what I'm given. Uh, I've done XL twice. There was one 2009. No, it wasn't. The, um... Let's think about. It. I did. I did a version of that in about 2014, 2015, and that was from Rolling Stones management, and they gave me what they had as their mastered audio, which was what was on the CD of the time. Um, I have done it since, and I was given a flat transfer of the master. So it, it really varies. I don't. I don't. I can't have any say in what I work on. You know, I, I, I get given what I'm given and I'd make the best of what I've got. Ideally, I'd like to either a very good flat transfer at higher resolution or the original tape if I can get it. But getting hold of original tape is hard now. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes an artist will say, no, this is the approved version. You will work from this. We don't care what you think. And you just have to work with it, you know. So, yeah, back in 2015, when I did the first half speed exile, uh, that was from another facility. I had nothing to do with that. And I just made it as good as I could. Um, the one that was in the box set, there was a Rolling Stones box set. Yeah. Uh, I was, I was going to ask you, I was going to ask yeah, you that's, that. That's I, a different, I, is that DSD? Um, could have been, I got sent, I was loaned a hard drive again by the management of Rolling Stones. And they said, this is what we think are the masters on here, flat transfers thereof. You're not getting the masters. This is the best we've got. There's a DSD transfer and there's a PCM transfer. Pick the one you like the, the best and do your thing. But we want this drive back in 24 hours. So I had to go through and like just copy everything I needed. Then then so I basically copied each, each version of each album, you know. Um, and um, then had to return the drive then i went through and worked out which i thought was best on a couple of the albums the dsd was better than the pcm usually the pcm was was the best but not always so i i just went with whatever was best so then you mostly work with pcm then i mean that's your go-to i would yeah. assume yeah. generally generally you know if i need to i will in a we get a pyramid system in here and i can i can work from dsd it's not a problem it's just it's very very hard any of the kind of the fine tuning i need to do for the dsing none of those tools work in the dsd world it's fairly hard to to do your work on so yeah uh, you know, I could come out, go through an analog DSer and do lots of edits, but that's just, that's not good. Technically, that's poor. So it, it just, P PCM, high resolution PCM is 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 very, very good source. And if you do it without using com extra compression and limiting, you know, the, 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 the compression you would use or the limiting you would use to make the digital version sound loud, you don't want that for records. So I never, ever do that. I only I have a very clean transfer, not artificially compressed. There's no need for that, um, and it sounds way better for it. 
So now I know, um, you know, let me get back to the Beatles for a second. I know a lot of people mm. are talking about, sure. you know, we have the red and the, the white album coming out as well. Um, now, how long did it take you to you master or cut those albums? Like how long of a process is that for you? Which album are we talking? Any well, of them? the whole. Sorry, the whole. Let's say the whole set. I should maybe clarify. Like, I mean, there's there's six albums all together. Six, you know, twelve sides. Like, what are we talking about in terms of in terms of time that you had to put into this? Oh, days and days and days and days. <laughs> Plus, the mixes keep changing because okay. I might get something to master, and then they'll get a comment from somebody. Uh, and you must remember that the way the Beatles always worked in the '60s was if any of the four of them didn't like something and they argued their case well enough it didn't come out you know ringo said don't like this song because of blah 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 that was right. it the song got oh. put away um that still holds true to this day so ringo and paul listen to everything um olivia and danny harrison listen to everything and yoko and sean listen to everything and all of them can have a say all of them can veto anything <laughs> so if i get a comment say from somebody saying it's a bit bright or this isn't right and we can't fix it it doesn't come out mm -hmm. so there's lots of to and fro so um normally it's before it gets to me sorry <coughs> i'm just choking away here t t drink some of that pep stuff, this tea. that peppermint tea you told me that's what it is drink some peppermint of that. tea i'm real living the rock and roll life here at abbey road you know yeah. it's all where I, there's some people having um, some issues, some people having some issues logging in, um, getting into the stream for some reason. So apparently you're supposed to log out and then log back in. It should work. I, we had some technical issues at the top, so I apologize for that. So hopefully yeah. everyone can do that. And if, if anyone wants, if someone wants to put in the comments, just tell everyone to log in, then log back, log out and then log back in. It should be fine. So yeah. Uh, George okay. had another, uh, what is he saying here? Sorry. Uh, Miles, any advantages on the mastering for 24 and uh, 192 versus 2496? Well, in theory, yeah, you know, because uh, 192, you have a even larger frequency range. You know, it goes up to sort of the, the frequency range you get is half of the sample rate. So 96 kilohertz, you've got 48 kilohertz of sample of, of audio range. So uh, 192, you've got 96. But, you know, is there much up there? There's a lot of there's, you need a really amazing recording for there to be much up there. Uh, that would affect the way you hear something but you know i always aim high if somebody sends me a tape to do a mastering session from i'll do it 192 because mm -hmm. why not you know um, the converters we have here sound really nice some there were some some of the early 192 converters didn't sound very good and actually you would choose to go 96 um because it just sounded better but that's long since been resolved so um it, again it's all down to whatever I'm given. If I'm given the tape, I'll do 192. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'll get a 192 transfer. Sometimes I get a 96 transfer. It's all it's all down to whatever I'm supplied. So it sounds to me, I mean, you're you you basically use what you have. I mean, it's you know not your decision. You get a file. You're using that file no matter what. So I think the folks or viewers or everyone needs to know. I mean, it's it's you can only do the best with what you have. Basically, it sounds like. You can only work with what you're given. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So okay. ideally, because I've got such an amazing sounding tape machine here, I want to get hold of the tape. But you know, some of these tapes are getting really worn now and they're in they're in bad shape. And it's really bad practice to keep running them. So I try you know, I, I don't want to be the person who played the tape the last time before it fell to pieces and destroyed it. So part of me doesn't really want to damage stuff if i can get hold of the tape and it, and it looks like it's in good shape i'll run it but you know if, sometimes you have to go with um a high res transfer because it's the best thing that's around so john bandy says miles do you notice any artifacts with the mixing such as sounds of one element will end up as part of another element well i don't hear the separated sources because that's giles and sam uh certainly since they've been giving the work to Wingnut, that's Peter Jackson's people in, in New Zealand, they just sound so natural and so amazing. I don't hear anything wrong at all. I mean, Revolver, to me, sounded the best of all of them. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how you felt that sounded, Steve, but um, it just it sounded so natural. 
uh, and their algorithms and their software is improving all the time. You know, I, I would be amazed what they could do with the early stuff, as I was saying earlier, like I saw her standing there. I was thinking, good job getting this full pulled apart, but it sounds fantastic. So I would say I don't hear anything, um, but I'm not party to the actual individual split up tracks because I don't get that. I'm the stage after that. Mm -hmm. It's Sam and Giles who get given the individual components and then build a new mix. So you, you basically cut it half speed. It goes to a test pressing. Then that test pressing goes back to Giles and Sam again. And the, and the whole, then the stage. Um, uh, what's the process there? The process is they get the audio files, the high res files I've mastered. And if everybody approves it, I then move to the, I did my DSing, which okay. is, you know, sit down and just fix the S's one by one. Then I'll cut an acetate because uh, we always insist on having an acetate for any half speed cut because you, I, although I can hear what's happening you know, with the music at slow as I've played it before, you can't really tell what's going on with the cut ahead. So I cut it half speed and play it back. And in the another corner of the room, we've got a Technics turntable, not super high definition hi fi, has to kind of be playable on good but not crazy esoteric hi fi. You know, I don't I don't test the test cuts on a cheap little briefcase thing because they mm -hmm. waste the time. They're yeah. rubbish. Everything sounds terrible on those. Don't care. But it, if someone's got a, you know, a fairly good bog standard hi-fi, you know, that's got a 150 pounds Audio Technica cartridge in it. It's, you know, it's good but not amazing, not audiophile. It has to work on that. If that plays fine, then um, I move to the cuts and then test pressings will come to me and will come to the chap at Universal who looks after the Beatles and we'll go through them, check we're all happy and if we're happy, they go off to the pressing. In the case of the red and blue, that was optimal for these ones. Okay. So, so how how long, I mean, I, you knew about this for a while, so I mean the red and blue albums, how long did it take them to uh, basically demix or remix them into into the format today like when did this project start Are you able to tell us that uh i started working on some of the tracks in crikey probably about june uh, and then it got very 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 intense june hmm. and july and i think we had all the cuts done by late july oh wow that's exciting. Uh, but, you know, that was lots of late nights and, you know, because I was fitting that in around other work because, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say if Giles gets in touch and says, oh, we got uh, 10 more Beatles songs for you that I wasn't expecting. It's like, I'm not going to say nah, not doing that. I, and I, I, I'm going to do it, obviously. So so um, I do it. But then I have to send my work back to Giles and Sam, check they're happy and then they check it with everybody else. So it's a lot of to and fro. Um but I, I was getting the tracks sort of five or ten at a time. Mm. You know, one of them came through, I think, actually after July when all the cuts were done and it was all approved, one track had to be changed. So I had to drop that in, recut that side, you know, get that rushed off to Germany for the for the pressing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it wasn't one long session or several long sessions. Okay. It was in bits. And then uh, we, we did... We did blue first. Blue was ready first, and red came along later. So the now and then sign that we talked about at the top that that actually blew. It sounds like it blew your mind in terms of what you heard heard off that song and what the demixing software did to it or did for it. Yeah, well, they they the demixing was just to get, extract John's voice from right. his demo, right. and yeah, it really did. I mean, I I can't say it on the stream because I swore, but you know, effing hell. I yelled out at the top of my voice uh, and I was on my own here. There's nobody in here. You know, they, they basically, um, I had an email the night before saying, got a new mix of now and then John sounds amazing. Now, can you do it tomorrow morning? And it's like, I'm already fully booked, but yeah, I'll get in at of course. Half past six. I'll get in at half past six and I'll do it. And I thought, Oh, it'll be a bit better. And I put it on and it's just kind of, I've, I had to pick myself off the floor. It's so good now. And because John sounds bigger, then they can make the instrumentation bigger. Everything's better. It's 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 a it is a great song. You know, it's it's. I wouldn't just say that just because I'm here and it's okay. Abbey Road and it's you know. No, it's it's a really good song. It's a great way for them to say, 
with goodbye. Me. Well, it's all, I know that I think Sean Lennon even said, I think his dad would have been really happy with the way it sounded. And so did uh, Danny Harrison in terms of John's yeah. voice. So they did. I, I'm excited. I mean, that's November the 2nd that comes out. So I, I think we'll yeah, get to hear it think, Thursday. Yeah. Yeah. It's on the, it's going to be on the radio here. And I think the stream goes live right after they played it on the radio. I think. Oh, wow. But, that this these things change rapidly who knows what the plan is i i'm not i i get to hear this fourth or fifth generation you know i'm just like chinese whispers so but it, it, at some point thursday it will be live for you to stream and and i think i'm not sure what date the vinyl comes out but there is going to be a seven inch and there's no, going to be november 10th 10 is the november is the 10th i think is the big day for the vinyl release for the physical that's the lps though right Yes. But there's a now and then single. There's a seven inch, a ten inch, and a twelve oh, inch yeah. single in a variety yeah. of colors. Oh well. Yeah, I don't no, know when that's November that might be coming in. November second is no and then. I'm not sure if they release the physical or it's just the stream then. Oh, that's what I was reading yeah. on the website. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So Miles, how's how does the sound of the new revolution, uh new mix sound of revolution? Oh, also. you mean the, the single version? Yeah. The, kind of the, yeah. the heavy metal version. Yeah. It's great. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, yeah, that hasn't got remixed before. You're quite right. That's the first time. And um, yeah, yeah, it was uh, it was good. They're all good. Even the even the early stuff is amazing. And the later stuff, obviously, when they had like eight tracks and stuff towards the end, it's far far easier to um, demix that and do something new with it. So do the lacquers go? Yeah, the lacquers go to Optimal. They do their plating. They are the best. Uh, hands down, Optimal. There's another company in the UK called Stamper Discs that do electroplating. They are the best in the business. I'd say they're better than you know who in Kansas. Um, yeah, Optimal. They're they're um, what's the word? Galvanic creation is 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 fantastic. The records come back sounding exactly as they should do. Here's a question for you, um, Miles. Yeah. Do you have a custom? Do you have custom cutting amps or a stock Neumann? I have customized Neumann, so it's a bit of both. Um, I've got custom parts. The That's the rack there, that silver rack there. Um, I've had that very much uh, tuned. The, had some of the transistors replaced. All of the capacitors in the audio path have been replaced. Now, I had them replaced with you know high-grade audiophile type caps. Now, if you take one cap out and swap it, you know, it's a tiny, 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 you wouldn't hear the difference. But when you've got hundreds of them in a signal path, suddenly all those little differences mm. become quite big. So, yeah, that's changed. Uh, in the last couple of years, I've replaced some of the other boards, my lathe tech and I. We're working on upgrading all sorts of things. There's a feedback circuit in there, which uh, Neumann, no, they did a great job. But, you know, their, their equipment was designed in the 70s. That's most of that stuff goes back to 74. So you can do better now. And um, in fact, my lathe tech came in. This was crikey a year and a half ago. He said, I've got these prototype boards that I'm making. Um, he said, Miles, when we built your boards for you, put your stuff together, you've got the best ones there ever were. I had some Swiss ones in mine. He said, just want to check that mine don't sound worse than the ones you've got. Is that OK? You know, come in, cut a few things change the swap the um feedback cards over cut the same things and play them back and see uh so we did that and he pulled the boards out put his ones in realigned the system because obviously it changes the lineup cut the same thing again and within about 10 seconds of playing the second cut which was his his cards i just thought wow this sounds really good and i just looked over to him and i said are you hearing what I'm hearing? And he just had this massive, massive Cheshire cat grin. And he said, it shouldn't sound any different. It should be the same. I said, it's not, is it? He said, no, it's not. You know, and I, I said, you're not leaving with those prototype boards. I'm keeping them. So, uh, so yeah, I've got those in since then. He's done another design as well. There's a V card in there, which is the kind of preamp. Mm. Think of it as the phono stage before the main right. amplifiers. The bit right. it goes through before the big 600 watts per channel. We replaced that card um, about a year ago, and that just moves some of the mush out of the way. That's so what I was going to ask next... you. So, so sorry, I just thought of this too. In terms of your system now, I mean, there's probably, and we'll get back to what you said. I just 
apologize for interrupting, but now that your system has been upgraded, there's probably some stuff looking back that you probably want to do redo now that your system is upgraded with these cards and whatnot. Oh yeah. 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 <laughs> I'd be interested. Uh, I'd like if anybody wants to kind of, maybe you can do a, a, sh a shootout. There's some, some, some of the stuff on here, let's say from, Put that up again. I want to, I want everyone to see okay. it. You're going, let's, you're going, you're going, yeah, you're, going yeah. you're going solo here. Go for it. Hey, so we now have three LPs and this is the new version. So side one, side two, side three, side four, side five, side six. So LP one's in here. LP two and three are here. Uh, so let's say, for example, on on here you've got some stuff let's say uh within you without you which obviously is on sergeant pepper now sergeant pepper was the first thing i cut on the lathe behind me um back in 2017 and uh you know things have changed since then so it would be interesting to do a kind of a, a shootout between if you've got a, a clean pressing from, from 2017 of sergeant pepper and then play the blue from there and see see what you think Miss, i i think it's better mr bandy appreciates the time you're spending with us and we do really thank you for this miles this has been it's so okay. far so right. been been amazing as well i had a quite i had a question on beatles i know the who's the who's next box came out and the single yeah. album that was plagiarism process now the box itself and i know you have no control over this was a full speed cut by you whereas the single album was a half speed cut yeah cut out twice I don't know why uh, it was. Yeah, I, I, I even I think I even suggested, well, why don't you just use the same metal parts? And they said, no, we need to do it all separate. So I did it twice. It's the same source, the same plant and process source for both. Uh, but yeah, one is half speed and one is real time. I think they want to kind of keep the half speed differentiated. I don't know why. So which one sounds better? Is that a is that a I'll always go with half speed always. I I have the half speed the single album I don't have the box set so I like okay. the sound of it I like the I think that's my that's my favorite Who album obviously Who's next I mean that's just oh brilliant. it's astoundingly good yeah and, and again see that's not my mastering that's mastered by John Astley from Close to the Edge right he's very close with Pete and he's Pete's go to guy uh, so I just get sent the audio he he does send me non limited audio now I've asked him for that and he does that um, and I just do my thing with him so I've worked with John on and off for about 15 years now so so yeah it's it's not always totally in my control uh but yeah that record what a, what an album now here's another thing i mean we have the 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 marley exodus the marley albums that you cut as well they're getting a lot of um praise like i've heard a lot of positive about exodus Are you getting you still hear me good i lost you for a second there steve sorry okay. yeah, i'm so Exodus uh, that you cut, yeah. did um, yeah. who was the mastering engineer in that? Did two mastered that? Was that another one that you were sent and you just basically half speed? Yeah, I was with? sent mastered audio for that. That was mastered uh, by Ted Jensen. Yeah, Ted that's Jensen. Good. That's right. Yeah. That's getting a, that's getting a lot of praise. There's been a few of my colleagues that do like uh, sort of blind blind YouTube uh, sort of shootouts, and that one mm. came out on top and actually more people like the sound of that one than the, than the UHQR version of Exodus. So there you go. As I say, half speed. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, what can I say? Those albums, Exodus is a great recording. Um, and Ted, I think he knows what he's doing. Let's be honest. He's been doing it some time. So, he's, been a, he's been doing it yeah. probably longer than I've been alive. So there you go. Yeah. Right? Around. Yeah. Uh, about as long as i've been alive probably not quite that long but nearly yeah. um yeah and they, they it sounded lovely so uh i my job with those was really i went through everything i did do a little bit of cleanup here and there you get little clicks and pops on the tape which i could take out um normally that's just where the bias for the tape machine is not set up right get little like, low level thump and stuff and those are actually very until recently, were quite hard to get rid of, but now you can just with the software just draw around it and just pull it down mm -hmm. and repair that bit. Uh, you can fix dropouts and stuff, but really, ninety nine point nine percent of the audio you're hearing on those Marley cuts is Ted's mastering. I'm not going to take any credit for the mastering because that's all his work. 
I just got I just did the best possible transfer you could from his mastered audio to the disc. Well, it's good effort on both of you guys' part. And I mean, it's come out, like I said before, um, in a blind shootout. That's been the top one, the Exodus uh, half speed cut at, at Abbey Road by Miles Scholl. So, congratulations. Yeah, well, that's nice. I mean, and, you know, Ryan is somebody that his work I greatly appreciate. So, it's nice to be considered to be up there with him, really. So, that's cool. Because I think Ryan did the UHQR version, right? He did. So, what are your, I know yeah. there was a comment, I, I'd have to scroll back up, but I mean, what are your thoughts on the UHQR and the MoFi One Steps? I mean, in terms as, as an engineer himself and the, and the sound of those ones, what do, you, what do you hear from them? Some of them are really good. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, the thing is, is that uh, you've got to try to, when I go home, I try not to spend too long focusing on the audio because that's just like being at work. You know, I actually just want to go home and enjoy music. Now, yeah, I've got a really nice turntable at home and, you know, I've got some really good pressings and some of them are the UHQR albums and they can. Maybe, maybe, some a, of them mile, sound maybe, a, mile, maybe a Miles Davis or two, possibly. Hmm. Uh, yeah, I wasn't that impressed with that. <laughs> I don't, I don't like kind of blue. I did Which... a shootout with a friend of mine, and we played the regular Columbia pressing, CBS pressing of kind of blue against. Admittedly, it was the thirty-three, not the forty-five. We all preferred the way the musicians sat together from the regular cut. I don't know who cut it. I don't know where it was done. It's the the bog standard, the normal pressing. Yeah. So, but then I've got other stuff. I've got the um De Brubeck Quartet timeout. It sounds fantastic, you know. I think it just depends on the tape, it depends on who cut it, it depends on mm. how good the plating was done. Tell There's so many variables. That's the problem with records, tell, you know. So, uh, you can't say all UHQRs are fantastic and all MoFi's are average, you know, and all mine are you know they vary they all vary uh so some are good some are not so good tell the folks at home what type of system you have when you go home to uh listen to music when i, when I play records at home i have mm -hmm. a turntable made by a firm called Verter. they're a uk-based company um it's run by turaj moghadam who was the brainchild behind roxanne if you remember roxanne the brand from the 90s he's a real kind of very clever mad professor guy and his whole basis is he loves music and um, i got to work with him or i got to i actually got, I met him at a hi-fi shop uh, he was doing some demonstrations and he's a good friend of pete thomas who is the boss of pmc loudspeakers and i use pmc monitors and uh, i was sort of going there in fact my latex said he's doing a tourage and vatera doing this demonstration Pete Thomas says he's really great. Let's go and have a listen to his record player. So I went along there and again, to kind of pick myself off the floor moments. So how is this turntable pulling out stuff from records that I'd cut, pulling out sounds that I'd never heard on any other turntable? Little percussive sounds and little keyboard parts that you just didn't hear and get lost in the mush. You're thinking, well, that, that never made it into the groove. It's like, oh, it did make it to the groove because I'm hearing it again. So yeah, his, his his system is amazing. I don't have his top range stuff because you know I'm a lowly recording engineer, but uh, yeah, I've got his system. He's got a, a turntable called SG One, and that's the um, Super Groove SG One turntable, SG One arm, and I've got one of his. You've got a moving coil cartridge called a Mystic, and uh, that's what I use. And I've got one of his Phono stages called a Phono One. Excellent gear, really good. I can't recommend Vater enough. Uh, and he doesn't pay me to say that. It's just, it's just good gear. Here, here's, a, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get. I saw this question here, and thank you for that. I always want to know what you were using at home. But John Bandy, one of the biggest takeaways for me is one can only master the source one is given. Obviously, perhaps, but we tend to blame the master engineer perhaps too often. And you see that or read that a lot that you're blaming the master engineer. But yeah. I think we talked about this a few minutes ago. It's about the source of the file that you're getting. And you can only do so much with that. And also, too, it has to be approved by the artist as well. So you're a, one, you're a small part in that cog, I would assume. Yeah. I mean, very rarely do I get given a complete free hand to do my thing and... I have final say almost never it always goes off to somebody else who has to approve it first and sometimes i want to do something and then the artist goes no nope, don't want that i want this 
and it's you think well it's your record you can present it however you want and then i get criticized saying well why didn't miles do this and i think well kind of wanted to do that but you know I, I, yeah you have to go with what the artist wants or what the pe person paying wants uh and then also you have to work with what you're given now a lot of people think all of these master tapes are in absolute mint condition and they're perfectly filed away and everything sounds amazing. Uh, and the reality is not quite like that. You know, a lot of stuff's missing. A lot of the really popular stuff's very, very worn now. So uh, sometimes you can't actually play the master because it's just worn down. There's nothing left because uh, it's a mechanical thing. You know, dragging a tape across the tape head, you're wearing it away. Um, and if that's been done 40 or 50 times before you get to it, it's not going to sound as fresh as it did when it was new. So, you know, sometimes you're, you're hunting around for a better, a, a, a less worn source. You know, now and again, you get a strike gold. I did a um, Alan Parsons project album, Eye in the Sky. And uh, I got sent the tape, which was a pneumatic digital cassette from mm. the early 1980s. And... Um, you know, it sounded like a digital recording from the early 80s. And they used that because that was the new, shiny, exciting thing. And I actually was talking with Alan and said, is there no analog of this as well? And he said, oh, yeah, yeah, I ran the analog machine because I didn't trust the digital because it was brand new. I said, can we find that tape? And um, lo and behold, it turned up and it had, in a big like Sharpie pen all over it, it just said, do not use, see, digital master. So I get this tape that hadn't been touched ever mint condition and this just it's like striking gold it never happens uh and everybody who's heard my version of eye in the sky says it's it's the one so yeah you know it's did you, that's, did you work, i was just lucky i i had a good source you know did, did parsons actually um sign off on that one did he listen to your file he signs first? off on everything everything yeah. everything he listens to yeah, yeah when i did the box set everything went to him first for approval before i cut anything wow and did he did he have a lot did he have a lot of critiquing? Did he say I want it, you know, I want it to sound this way instead of what you have? Yeah, I mean, there's a that. lot that I went mean, back and forth. Not a lot because he's a fantastic engineer. So yeah. those recordings are amazing. The the advantage I had uh was for a lot of it, um his uh, so his co writer and the composer of most of the tunes was a chap called eric wolfson mm -hmm. in the alan parsons project eric kept copies of everything so while alan was running the master machine he ran a separate machine at the same time and those tapes went to eric who just put them on a shelf and then eric so, eric's daughter is the one that actually uh gave the tapes for the latest box set that you cut yeah well that. eric yeah because eric mm -hmm. is no longer with us sadly so That's his right. daughter she looks she looks after his library now the tapes are in a vault up in scotland they're not easily accessible but mm -hmm. she has higher resolution transfers thereof and that's what i was given um, and i had higher resolution transfers from sony for the original masters and her uh, sally's higher resolution copies and in nearly every case Sally's tapes won because they just weren't played. They were in mint condition. They just sounded much fresher. So we used those. A couple of the albums they didn't have um, in Sally's collection, but most of it was there. Um, <clears throat> for Eye in the Sky, we used the quarter-inch um, mm. tape I mentioned earlier. Um, so, yeah, but it went off to Alan, and he, he came up with a few comments. Could I change this? Could I change that? One of the things, he said, you've over de what this track. And I said, I haven't <laughs> de anything yet. I said, that's how the recording is, said, but I can fix it. You know, the same software I use to do de I can actually fix an over de vocal. Oh, wow. And if if you don't know, but it sounds like the singer has a lisp if you do too much de You just soften it too much. Mm -hmm. So I'm able to kind of go back in and literally just turn that little bit up. You know, you just once the the what the software I use is called um, RX by Isotope. Okay. And it it converts the music into a picture. And once you know what to look for, you know, you can see things coming up. You know, oh, here we go. Here comes an S, or there's an S missing. You can you can find it and just you know turn it. That little area you can just turn it up. It's it's really amazing. So I was able to fix stuff that's never been fixable until very recently. But yeah, mostly with Alan, it was just yeah, everything's fine, or just uh, maybe a bit more top or a bit more of this, but minor changes. So because his recordings were great, you know, they all they all sounded lovely to start with. 
What tape machine do you use? I know there was a viewer that was asking. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Uh, at the moment, I have an Ampex ATR-102 in here. Um, and that's Abbey Road's machine, which they inherited from Olympic Studios when Olympic mm. closed. Yep. Um, and that's a great sounding machine. I've got my own heads for it. I've got custom heads, which only I use. Lock them away when I'm not here. Uh, but uh, since uh since then i've acquired my own atr and ampex machine that is off being restored uh and i'm having some work done to that and that's going to be really really funky having it modified to do all analog cutting uh because ampex tape machines didn't do that um not the atr series anyway they only worked you know in one pass uh, if you wanted to cut even in the 70s if you wanted to cut from an ampex tape machine you had to use a digital delay but i'm uh, ryan at sterling they've had theirs modified i'm having a similar sort of thing done with my one it's taking time to be done and i won't start working off of it until i'm totally sure that it's as amazing as it can be but you know at some point i'll be using that now maybe it's costing a lot of money to get that machine converted to be able to do that. I may never recoup that investment. <laughs> it, it might be, you know, it might be that because you don't often do, you know, all analog cutting. But if I can, I will, and I'll be able to do it very soon. I mean, right now, when I need to do that, I've got to do one in a couple of weeks. I'll run upstairs and I'll go into Sean McGee's room and I'll use his room um, because I can't do that at yet in in this are my custom heads flux magnetics yes yeah the best using a delay head instead of a preview head um eventually yeah that's that's what you would do when you're doing it all analog you have two heads on the machine uh the first head that the tape passes goes off to the disc cutting groove spacing computer it then goes through a big loop which is the equivalent of half revolution of time and then the second head is what actually gets cut onto the disc. So the groove spacing computer looks at what's coming up and thinks, well, I've just cut a groove that's this shape, but there's lots of bass coming up that does this. So I need to open up accordingly so that the, the next groove doesn't smash into the last one and cause a jump. So that's why you need to have two heads and have the, the loop of tape. So have you done any uh, like sort of triple A cuts in your career? I'm assuming in the beginning yeah, you probably yeah, did. That's yeah, what I'm saying. yeah I'll, I'll go up to Sean's room and do them up there. And yeah. then I'll, the, the triple A's will be done in here when my machine's ready. And it's already been about a year and a half since I acquired it. I actually bought it from Genesis. They, they closed their studio and I bought their tape machine. Uh, and it's a good one. It's a really nice machine. Uh, but I'm having all sorts of modifications done to it. I'll have a, a choice of three different amplification systems for the heads. Uh, just, you know, it's going to be everything the best of the best. So with the, going back to the Beatles, I mean, I was hoping, I mean, we know we got the red and the blue albums coming out November 10th. I was really hoping, I know you've seen some of my other, my other videos. I was really hoping more of the actual albums like Rubber Soul, um, that type of album. But with the songs from the red album that have been, um, I guess, demixed and remixed by Giles now, um, what are you hearing that, that makes it so exciting and so fantastic compared to the old stuff now? Well, they just come alive now, especially yeah. the please, please me stuff. You know, I saw her standing there, twist and shout. You know, you can hear John's voice collapsing as he's singing it because <laughs> uh, that was the last thing they recorded. You know, they, they that session for please, please me. There was basically the two singles added on, you know, they, the please, please me single and the love me do single were, were added on. But everything else was um, done in, in a 12 hour day. And John had a really terrible cold and George Martin had gone up to the cavern and seen them playing. And he just thought, we've got to do Twist and Shout last because John screams in that and he's not going to be able to scream and sing anything else afterwards, especially with the cold. And uh, you can, if you listen to Twist and Shout, his voice is just about hanging in there at the end. He's only just getting right. it out. Yeah. Uh, they did another take of it, but it fell apart very quickly because it was just, it was gone. So, but um, yeah, so those early recordings, um, nearly all of, uh, see, we called it with the Beatles. So the one with the black and white cover with the mm -hmm. half faces. Um, that up there. All but two, yeah, all but two, well, that's, that's the American. That's, that's the American, meet the, the Beatles, meet, meet the Beatles, meet the Beatles or Beatles, Canadian, yeah. yeah. 
yeah 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 same same pictures but different different running orders so i hate i hated that especially growing up and being a fan of the beatles and not having the internet and i didn't really understand there was two different two different uh releases Amer north american yeah. versus i just it just yeah anyways i'm glad that it's now back to yeah, normal. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> it, it is what it is, and they did the, they did their thing in they did their thing in North America, and uh, some of it was good. I mean, let's be honest, their version of the Magical Mystery Tour, that's a great album. You know, with, yep. with the singles on the B side, great, and not necessarily the duophonic versions, but that idea of the compilation. It's the they really got it got it right then. Some of the other ones, I mean, they're the capital version of Revolver. I mean, it's just a disaster, and let's be honest, yeah. it's terrible. I, but you I, know, I, it, it, it is what it is. Anyway, so we're going back to the the demixing. Those early recordings, most of with the Beatles and all of Please Please Me, was done to two tracks. So all the vocals on one track of the tape, and all the instrumentation on on another track, and they really have come to life now you listen to i saw her standing there and it's a bunch of 20 year olds having fun and jumping about and it's so exciting in a way that you don't i mean it sounds great originally but it's just it comes to life because the way it's been mixed it's so natural sounding the the giles and sam really have done a fantastic job has the earliest demix remix uh, process improved since 2007 i guess or 17 I yeah guess? oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Okay. it's improving all the time um and it, it's so good now i mean really good now before it was kind of yeah all right but now it's really good i mean we're lucky that we've got peter jackson and his people and mm -hmm. peter jackson's a massive beatles fan so Clearly. he's very 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 hands-on as far as i'm told uh so everything just comes back from there sounding oh. glorious that's great. So, Miles, we're going to leave it at that. We've, we've okay. an hour in, and we promised an hour. I really appreciate your time. I would like you to come back at some point. Are you able to do that? We can do that again. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah. I would appreciate that. Well, thank you so much for your time. And we broke the internet on this on that first go round. I know people had some issues with this stream. Apparently, it was not. They were able to get back in, so you can watch the recording of it back on my channel as well. I'm not sure what was happening there. We had some technical difficulties on our first stream, so we're back in here and. Hopefully it's uh, looking pretty good for most that are uh, watching today. But uh, I wanted to thank you so much. This was really informative. I learned a lot today and I always love chatting with you. And I really, really appreciate you taking the extra time. I know we were only scheduled to start at 9 a.m. PST and we're now two hours past that. So I, I, I appreciate uh, hanging in and I appreciate your patience with everything. It's all good. Well, thank it's you. Until, These well, things until, go wrong and, uh, you know, that happens. Don't worry about it. I, yeah, I, I, thanks for everyone, for the viewers, for hanging in, too. I don't know what happened there, but I'm glad it, we rebooted it. We got a, we got a half-speed reboot of this, so that's pretty good. That's so watch, it. Watch, watch the replay. It'll be up, and um, you know, have a great rest of your week, Miles. It was a real, real honor and pleasure uh, chatting with you today. Thank you so much. And let me know what you think of now and then when you hear I, it. I will for sure. I'm sure we'll talk about yeah. it on one of my roundtables, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's have a, a good, Yeah, well, have a yeah. good day. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Cheers.